the Russia-Ukraine conflict, how will it end? This is Jay Rogers. I am the director of The Forerunner. And the last video I did got a few more views than usual, but it was very long. It went on for about an hour and a half. And I shared a lot of information. And what I wanted to do in this video is just to start off with how I ended the last one and explain it a little bit more clearly. I believe that the Ukraine-Russia conflict could actually be end with the help of Poland. And I'm going to explain exactly what I mean by this, but here are my different points. Um, I'm not a prophet and I'm not predicting the future. Like I know this is going to happen, but the more I look at this, the more that I think that this is possible. Uh, I have a good friend of mine who was born and lives in Ukraine. He's um, ethnically Russian and he is very much against the Euromaidan government. And he was telling me that uh, he believed that when this was all over, that there would actually, if there was a Ukraine left, left, that it would be a divided Ukraine, uh, several different republics. And I thought that when he said that, that that sounded a little bit extreme. <clears throat> but as this has gone on, and I'm looking at this, I think that that's actually a possibility. So there's actually a plan right now to um, reunify the historic boundaries of Poland and Ukraine. I'm going to go over that in a minute. But basically, they would erase the border between Poland and Ukraine. And what that would accomplish would be, um, first of all, you would reintegrate some of these Western cities that are historically Polish, like uh, Lutsk and Lviv and Ivanovo-Frankivsk, uh, which is known as uh, Galicia, historically. And you would basically reintegrate those regions back into a reconstruction of pre-World War II Poland. Okay. And then the other thing it would do, number two, it would fast track Ukraine's de facto membership in the EU as part of Poland. Because Ukraine's membership in the EU is about 10 to 15 to 20 years off. And economically, Ukraine could not survive. Um... Also, the cultural boundaries between Ukraine and Poland are similar to those with Russia. Uh, Ukrainians can actually comprehend Polish fairly well. They can understand Russian. And both are fairly close to their language. Um, also, Lviv, which is uh, this city right here in Poland, it's called Lvov. And in Russian, it's called Lvov. This is a Polish city. I visited that city back in 2007. And it's very much like an Eastern European city rather than a, uh, like, a, it doesn't look anything like a Soviet city or a Russian city. Okay. Now, Ukraine is non-NATO, and I think that the final um, agreement is going to be that they can't join NATO. But it will be necessary um, for there to be some type of a peacekeeping plan, a security plan. And so what this does temporarily is that, um, this is number three now. Ukraine's not NATO, but Poles will be granted dual Ukrainian citizenship and vice versa. Uh, the people who have emigrated to Poland from Ukraine will also have Polish citizenship. And they might, they'll be able to legally serve in the Ukrainian military while the war is still going on, kind of like as protection for Western Ukraine. And then later in peacekeepers in Western Ukraine after Russia demilitarizes uh, the eastern portion and the southern portion, which would be this area in red right here. Um, also, number four, the partitioning of Ukraine into an alliance with peacekeeping forces from two, three, or four, or even five countries. You would have Russia, Ukraine, Romania, Hungary, and Poland, right? These were the ethno-linguistic boundaries prior to World War II. And they could also they could get into a security agreement with another nation close by, like Turkey and possibly even China, that would guarantee security for what remains of Ukraine if there was ever another conflict. So, in other words, you could have Romanians stationed in the border of Romania, Hungarians stationed in the area where there are a lot of Hungarians, and then Poland in unity with Western Ukraine and perhaps all of Ukraine that's left over. All right. And then the other thing that's interesting is that the the radical or what they call the ultra nationalist element actually comes from the western part of Ukraine, which is uh, the part that was historically Polish, and they fought uh, with the Nazis 
after be, during and after World War II against the Soviets, and they were trying to drive the Soviets out of Ukraine, establish a uh, establish a nation that would be in alliance with Germany. And even after Germany fell to the Allies, they continued an underground resistance up until about 1955. And so the Poles don't like these ultra nationalists very much because they fought with the Nazis, and they killed many um, Poles and Gypsies and uh, Jews as well as Russians. They, they were basically a um, it's ultra nationalist group, and so number five would be Western Ukraine would become denazified. There are these statues and memorials to Stepan Bandera and other Ukrainian Nazi leaders in Lvov. Those those would be torn down, and you know since they since these Nazis hunted down and killed many Poles, their days will be numbered. So if the countries are reunified, that would actually please Russia because that's their goal in eastern Ukraine is to denazify that area. The, the militias came from western Ukraine to fight in the Donbass region, which is the Donetsk uh, basin along with Lugansk. And basically that's the, the, the one of the objectives of the war is to demilitarize and to denazify uh, eastern Ukraine. So a Polish presence in Ukraine could uh, kind of solve that problem. Now, before you say I'm crazy and this could never happen, I want to show you a couple of recent news articles. Um, and a lot of people don't really know about this, but this is these are things that have been happening um, in Ukraine. Now, this is from Russian news, but you don't find this in the West very much. You don't. Th these articles are out there, but this is more of a big deal um, outside of the United States and Western countries. First, on, let's see what the date was here. This was, I think this was May 2nd, or here we go, May 2nd. Ukraine can't claims Hungary wants its territory. A top Kyiv official claims Hungary was informed of the Russian attack in advance and wants to take Ukrainian territory. And so this is Prime Minister Viktor Orban, right? Um, he was added to a database listing enemies of the Ukrainian state. Okay. Um, this is the Alexei Danilov. Hungary open talks about its cooperation with Russia. More than that, it was given early warning by President Vladimir Putin that our country would be attacked. So he was um, doing a little media appearance, answering questions about whether Hungary could block Ukraine's admission to NATO. Hungary thought it could take part of the territory. This will never happen. Victory will definitely be ours. And about Hungary, which behaved this way, we will see what the consequences will be for this country. And there's a lot of other things going on with Hungary right now that I won't get into, but this is all related. Okay. The second thing would happen was more recently, this was um, Ukraine was granted special legal status to Polish nationals. Uh, and this is what I was referring to earlier. Kiev is set to facilitate cross-border travel and grant other perks to Poles. So this is um, Polish President Andrzej Duda and Volodymyr Zelensky at a meeting in Kiev on May 22nd. There should be, this is what, uh, in the words of Zelensky, there should be no borders or barriers between us. Mentally, the Ukrainian and Polish people have been inseparable for a long time. And therefore, we have agreed to translate this into an appropriate bilateral agreement in the near future. Then earlier in the month, Duda, who is the Polish president, said this, there should be no border between Poland and Ukraine in the future. The two nations would live together on this land, building and rebuilding our common happiness and common strength that will allow us to resist every danger. Okay. And then this is an aid to um, Zelensky, Sergei uh, Nikiforov. We need to pay attention to the law that was adopted in Poland for temporary displaced persons in Ukraine, which actually equated the citizens of Ukraine with the citizens of Poland, but without the right to vote accordingly in Ukraine at the initiative of the president, let's say a similar law will be adopted. So Ukrainians will become Polish citizens. They won't vote for the president of, of Poland. Um, they'll vote only in local elections and national elections in Ukraine. And then Polish people will be able to um, be Ukrainian citizens, but won't be able to vote in Ukraine. So it'll be reciprocal. So it's kind of like a 
almost like the situation with the European Commonwealth, where you have different countries in one Commonwealth, but they're but they're still separate political nation states. Okay. Um, this is another one. Poland and NATO have eyes on Western Ukraine, according to Belarus. So this is a so Belarus and Russia aren't happy about this, but as I said, this could actually work out better. It says outside actors are plotting a takeover of Western Ukraine and Belarus. The Belarusian president claims Belarusian Belarusian president Alexander Lukashenko expressed concern over alleged attempt by Western countries to dismember Ukraine amid Russia's ongoing military operation in the country. The politicians are taking steps to dismember. Ukraine, we are worried that the Poles and NATO members are ready to come out to help in this way, to take away as before 1939 Western Ukraine, the Belarusian president said. In his opinion, the West has a similar strategy when it comes to Western Belarus. Okay, so this is basically there are all of these Belarusian troops now on the Polish and Ukrainian border waiting to defend the country. And then this just happened today. Today is the 27th as I'm reading this, and this is about seven hour time difference between here and Europe, but Boris Johnson reportedly wants to establish a group of like-minded states as an alternative to the EU. So I don't know if you are aware of this, or but I firmly believe that NATO and the, the, um, the European Union might not exist by this time in two years. And if it does exist, I think that it's going to be in a radically different format. So already Boris Johnson, when Boris Johnson's days are numbered, he's not going to be around for another year either. But um, he's reportedly suggested Ukraine join a new alliance, which London is supposedly seeking to establish a structure parallel to the EU. So in other words, they could they could join an economic alliance um, and, you know, this is his words. It says, um, this is um, Correa de la Serra, citing people familiar with the talks. London has been actively working to set up a European Commonwealth for more than a month now. Johnson has reportedly been trying to launch an alternative to the EU that would include the UK, Ukraine, Poland, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithu Lithuania, and possibly Turkey. The new alliance would reportedly welcome nations to value their sovereignty, our proponents of economic liberalism, and are determined to repel the military threat from Moscow. So I, I consider, I, I liked Boris Johnson when he first got in because I thought he was, you know, a populist that was going to, um, you know, make sure Brexit happened. Now that he's swung completely to the different uh, direction and he's trying to establish basically NATO and the EU um, with Ukraine. And if NATO members don't like it, the EU members don't like it, they're going to go ahead and do it anyway. And I think that this will actually happen. But I think that um, it's going to happen for a completely different reason than people think it is going to. All right. They, they think that this is, can repel Russia, but I don't believe that Russia wants anything to do with attacking NATO. I think that what they want to do is basically take certain lands for security interests in Russia and establish a civilization state. A civilization state is not a, it's not a country based on national boundaries, language, um, political alliances and things like that, but more like just deep culture, you know, the religion of the nation, um, the common shared heritage and so on. And that's how they view Russia as, as a civilization. So Ukraine could exist in several different formats, but Russia kind of considers the Slavic family as being part of their sphere. And so... I know it's hard to believe, but after the war, they're going to be working to reestablish relationships. And you may think like, well, no, that's not true. You know, Russians will hate, I mean, Ukrainians will hate Russians forever and ever. But you have to remember like what happened in Chechnya not long ago. Now the president of Chechnya basically is pro-Russian and they're fighting with the Russians in wars. So if anything can happen, most of the people that live in this part of the world are mainly interested in having food on their table and to be able to to do better you know kind of like people in our country are, m most people are like that they don't really care who's in power as long as that economically um, things go well and this is an idea that's been around for a while uh, this was in the Atlantic this is back in 2014 
is a time for Ukraine to split up and it's showing how Ukraine is, is divided ethnically. And so they're saying it's possible that something like this could actually happen. Um, as I showed you before, the population centers of Ukraine are mainly along the borders and along the Dnieper River. So the Dnieper River starts in Kyrgyzstan, it goes up to Dnipro and follows this line up to Kiev and then goes north into Russia. Okay. And then you have um, this heavily, heavily historically Russian and, and ethnically and linguistically Russian area in this area, which is very dense. Uh, Kharkiv, which is also, or Kharkov, as the Russians call it, which is also very densely Russian, and then Crimea. And so what the Russians have done is, well, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, these, this is a very good um, article. I showed you this before. I'm just going to briefly go through it again. I'll have all these links down on the bottom. But we tend to think of like Western Ukraine as being Russian. Central Ukraine as being Ukrainian. And it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, there's a political division. You can see that, you know, Victor, Victor Yushchenko who is the party that was more pro-Russian, won big in Donbass back in 2004, and big in Crimea, and then got more than, this is like 50-50, 70-30, 60-40 in these regions. And then when you go into this part of Ukraine, it's kind of leaning more towards nationalism I'm sorry, I, I said Yushchenko. I meant um, Yanukovych, who is a pro-Russian candidate, and Yushchenko was the pro-Ukrainian candidate. And you see out here, he got like 90%. Because these are the ultra, these are the, the real nationalist Ukrainians are here. Um, like even Kiev is somewhat divided. The large cities are somewhat divided. Um, and it's funny, you get into the area that's close to Hungary, and they're not quite as, a lot of Hungarians and and another group called the Ruthenians live there, and the room, it's not quite as nationalistic as these four uh, regions right here. Okay, so this is the more of a correct view here, which is that you have a core Ukraine, you have the far west, which is very nationalistic, and Transcarpathia, which is Hungarian, and then these two regions, which are very strongly Russian. And this is um, the idea is to establish an area called Nova Russia, which would be an independent republic, or it would be part of Russia, probably part of Russia at this point. So this is historically what um, it looked like. This is what was actually what um, Russia looked like 100 years ago. This was Russia. This was Ukraine. And part of this was, but well, we'll get to that in a moment, too. And you can see how the closer you get to the Russian border, right, the more the language change. Uh, this, this is actually ethnic groups. And I said that in my majority language, excuse me. Um, it's very difficult to explain what an ethnic group in, is in Russia because uh, it means different things. About 15 to 20 percent of Ukraine speaks Russian as a native language. Um, and most people can switch back and forth between these languages with no problem. But many people speak this other version called Surzik, which is a blend of Russian and Ukrainian. And they switch back and forth so often that the languages have corrupted each other. So the more you get out into the country, you hear that. It's, is it Russian? Is it Ukrainian? What are they speaking? As you get more towards the east, it becomes more like Ukrainian. And really, there are only four regions historically, these four right here, that were um, where people spoke mostly are all Ukrainian. Um, this was known as Galicia, and this was part of Poland at one time. And as a matter of fact, these cities, Lviv, I think that's Ivana Frankovsk, and right on the border here, these are Polish areas where they speak, a lot of people speak Polish, according to this. Okay? So I'll put a link to this article. This is very interesting. Um, there's that original map. This is another, uh, this is from a, from a TV show in Russia, and they actually showed this map, and this would be uh, Polsha, which is Poland. 
this is the green area and then the divided area that would be divided Ukraine and then down here this would go to Moldova and then this would be part of Russia so this is a very common idea it's not like just you know a conspiracy theory people have talked about this this is what the Ukrainians would like to see Russia look like by the way <laughs> which is this is from the same TV show this was uh they were discussing this back in what year what year is this 2018 and so just as a joke they put up well this is what we think the future of Russia is and this is actually this is not a joke either this is what um, a lot of Western people like you know George Soros and so they'd like to weaken Russia so that there's all this ethnic unrest I don't think it would it would break up into like 20 different republics but possibly like four or five that's their vision for Russia make it weak destroy the economy and then break it up and sell it off to different corporations kind of like what we've done in a lot of third world countries so um, this is another article what is Ukraine kind of similar this, these are the these are the regions okay this is Sarcarpathia or Transcarpathia which is Hungarian and part of that was also part of Slovakia or, or Czechoslovakia at one point uh, these are the four um, Polish regions and this line actually went up to the top of Belarus at one point so Poland the, it was called the uh, Lithuanian Polish Empire or kingdom and what else do we have here so I was in Lviv this is a pretty good um, this is a pretty good uh, picture of this looks very much like an Eastern European city it's older it's not Soviet at all you don't see any of the type of Soviet architecture unless you get out into the suburbs and you see some apartments but it's a very historic beautiful city and it's a Polish city it looks a lot like Poland there Okay, so that's they have a lot of nice castles and uh, there's a lot of Catholic churches in that area too. Okay, this is the ancient, or I don't know exactly what um, era this is, but you see there's a line of modern Ukraine, and you see how there are different regions that are a part of that. Okay, this is a very good. Um, Let's see if I can article that I'll also link to. This is called the Ukraine uh, profile. Let's see if I can. I don't know what happened to that window. I may have canceled that out, but mm, stay map. These are two articles that I'm going to link to as well. This is an article from, um, I've never heard of this before, it's some college somewhere, but it's ethnic and linguistic identity in Ukraine is complicated. And it gets goes through all of the things that I talked about, like what's the nationality, what's native language, um, declared ethnicity and language, ethno-linguistics, and so on. And it, very much influences the politics of the area okay and this gives you a whole timeline of Ukraine from you know the earliest times all the way up to the present I'll link to that as well all right now to look at the war let's talk about the war a little bit what's happening and I'll sum up what I said in my last video more succinctly uh, this is going back to uh, April 4th and what had happened up to this point was in February 24th Russia attacked from several different fronts. There was a Kiev front There was a Sumy front which also it might be also known as the Chernihiv front. There was a Kharkiv front There were there was a very long line um, along Donetsk and Lugansk and that line had been there that front had been there since 2014 and had gone back and forth and this was the current administrative line that was supposed to be enforced by the Minsk agreements but failed so what happened was in the very very, very beginning of the war, and then also um, Russia invaded from um, Crimea and there was a front going west uh, toward Kyrgyzstan Nikolaev and Odessa and then east toward um, Militopol and Mariupol or Mariupol 
All right, so there's three different versions on how you can see the war. One of them is the Western version, which says that um, Russia is failing, that they're losing, and they um, they blundered by trying to attack Kiev, and that uh, they lost that part of the war. Now they're on phase two, and people will tell you that they're still losing in eastern Ukraine, which is a lie. It's not true. And then all we need to do is just keep giving them more weapons and they'll be able to drive Russia out of Ukraine. And the Ukrainians will take back Donbass and they'll take back Crimea. I think that that's people who say that are dangerous and crazy because that would basically lead us into World War III. Okay. And I don't think it, I don't think it can happen. I think that economically uh, things in the West are going to get so bad that people are going to turn against this I call it a proxy war because it's basically NATO and the U.S. fighting Russia by fighting, uh, by fight by arming Ukraine. That's the other view, is that you know Russia in the beginning their stated goal was not to occupy all of Ukraine, but to basically liberate Donbas, um, demilitarize eastern Ukraine so that there wouldn't be any problems here, and especially get rid of the Nazi militias which were in Mariupol along the southern border and then along the Donbass re regional line. And if you look at different maps, like you can see where these different... In 2014, what happened, there was a revolution in Kiev. Uh, Crimea acceded, I'm gonna call it, not seceded, but they acceded to Russia. Um, there was also, there were riots in Odessa. There were these um, neo-Nazi groups that came into Odessa and they put those down. They killed about 40 people and then people in Donetsk and Lugansk wanted to separate from Ukraine, but not separate from Ukraine as a country, but just federalize their region so that they could decide if they wanted to teach Ukrainian in school to their kids, if they wanted to do business in, in I mean, excuse me, Russian, they're Russian speakers. So in the rest of Ukraine, you had to, Ukrainian became an enforced language. Uh, it had to be taught in schools and so on. It had to be the language of business um, in the southern regions, they basically turned off the eternal flame for World War II veterans. There was no more May Day celebrations. Instead, they celebrated Stepan Bandura Day, which was the Nazi who fought the Soviets. So a lot of people were very insulted by this. And they thought that, you know, it would be like, you know, having a political party come in and saying, we're no longer going to fly the American flag. And we're, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, what they call, what do they call it? The, um critical race theory, that type of thing. It's basically Ukrainian's own version of critical race theory. All Russians were communists and Nazis, and then the Russians have their own view toward the Western part of Ukraine. They're saying that they're Nazis. And historically, that's true. It's not like every person fighting in this militias were Nazis, but there was an ideology which basically said, we want Russia out of, and they looked at anyone that was pro-Russian as Russian, not you know Russian-speaking Ukrainians, and so on. All right, so what you can do with this map is you can see the progress of what happened. Um, that was that's the view of 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 the Western and the Ukrainian view is is that Russia attacked for no reason. They came down with all these lines, and they blundered. They're being pushed out. Um, the Russian view is that they're ju they were just trying to liberate Donbas and Crimea, and that the reason why they brought in all these other lines was to pin these other troops to Kiev. Uh, right now they're pinning them to Kharkiv and keeping them from joining the battle in Donbass so the Russians can be more effective there. I agree with that to a certain extent, but I also think that there's a third view, which is like a middle view. Oops, I'm jumping all over the place here. And the middle view is this, is that in the very beginning, Russia attacked from all different fronts and they didn't have a plan. Like they thought, like maybe if we attack from Kiev, that people will panic, that the president will leave the country, that things will turn very fast, and that there'll be re regime change, and that we can install a puppet government and end the war very quickly, and then negotiate with a more reasonable government. And that when that didn't work, they said, well, what's working? This is definitely working down here, because as you can see, I'll play the video here, uh, this is going to go day by day. And what happened was, was that um, as Russia pulled out of the north, there started to be very strong, um, very quick advancement 
in the east and in the south. You can see that they they all these lines are called salients, where they moved in troops and they began to create these little pockets with these salients, which are like little lines that point out and go forward. And then once troops are surrounded or areas are surrounded, they close those areas. It's called um, the salient formation or the cauldron formation. See, this is a Ukrainian map because it's so you can see that if you were to just if you were to just say that Russia's goal was to win in the east, then they're definitely making progress. If you say it's to occupy all of Ukraine, then obviously what's happening is, is that they're they're failing because they're never going to do that. But you look what's happened like even like in the last day, it's quite dramatic. And many people believe that Russia is, I mean, Ukraine is very close to a collapse in this area. And then the last big battle will be Kramatorsk, and then they'll take all of Lugansk and the Don, all the Donbass region, which is, um, it's Lugansk and Donetsk. And you can see the administrative line runs up like this. Okay. And then Lugansk is 95% taken. They just have this little, it comes from north up here. Okay, so then what would happen from there, I believe, is that Russia would go to um, the Ukrainian government and say, look, you know, let us hold referendum, uh, referenda in the Kyrgyzstan Republic or the Kyrgyzstan region and the uh, Zaporizhia region and see if these people want to accede to Russia. And Kiev will say no. And then what they will do is they'll continue to, to fight. At a certain point, the economic situation of the entire world is going to break bad, break down. If the war isn't over by September, then there's going to be a very serious problem. Either we're going to have World War III or the Western powers are going to sue for peace. Okay, And that's, that's going to be my next video. I'm going to get into that a little bit more. But um, that's, that's basically it. I think that... Um, it's, it's a real interesting time that we live in, okay? Um, Ukraine is a wonderful country. I have been there um, 10 times, and I've been in Russia 10 times. So I've made 12 trips total, and, you know, I, I have friends in both countries. I have people on both sides of the argument. Russians are very angry about what's happened in Donbass for the past eight years, since 2014. And then the um, Ukrainians are very angry at Russia because they think that um, they just invaded them for no reason and that they want to take the whole country. But I think that more likely what's going to happen is, is that um, there'll be this corridor of these four regions and possibly these four if things go on. There will be a, a central Ukrainian government that agrees to demilitarize. And there will be a, um, a Western portion that has, um, for instance, there, there's been talk about Romania moving troops into Moldova. And the reason for that is to deal with this border right here, which is called Transcarpathia. I mean, excuse me, this is called Transnistria. And Russians would probably want to um, annex or the Transnistrian, people who live in Transnistrian want to join Russia. That's the whole reason why they're there. Russians have always refused that, but that's what they want. So it's possible that this could it go all the way to the border, at which point the Romanians would move troops into the, along this border. And they would also have peacekeeping troops up here along this border as well. Um, the Poles would deal with this line up here. And it's possible that the Hungarians might put things up here and that eventually you'd have, you know, four or five different republics. It looks like four here, but this this area down here is in dispute too. So also this area down here is interesting as well. You have um, different ethnic groups in along here. This was historically part of Romania and there's a lot of Russians that came into here. Okay, so that's my video for today. I'm going to come back um, another time and we're going to talk about um, the, the multipolar world 
and I'm actually working on an article on that. If you want to know everything about the politics behind this, I really recommend this video. I have it on my website. It's um, This is Oliver Stone's series. There's a trilogy. Uh, there's Revealing Ukraine. It's, um, Ukraine on Fire, Revealing Ukraine, and the Everlasting Present. And I will link to the, the different articles and um, sites that I mentioned in my, my talk here. Um, you can always donate if you want to encourage me. Um, I don't live off of this or anything like that, but it's always encouraging like when someone, you know, if you want to like give me one penny or 11 pennies or 11, 11, something like that. You can donate with PayPal or you can donate with a credit card. And I don't beg for donations, but I've had several people who have been very generous with me recently and it helps. And it encourages me to do more videos. I will see you probably within the week with another one.